Hello. Hi. I'm Keith Ghostland. I'm Ann Charles. And I'm Linda Quinlan. It's June 16th. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We're taping in Mount Pilia, which we acknowledge as unceded indigenous land. So I, I, might, I might have a few things, but I'm gonna start with a trivia question. We all acknowledge the Stonewall Riots, June 28, 1969, is sort of the beginning of the modern LGBTQ political movement. How many people were actually arrested at the riot? And I won't tell you that Linda came closer than Ann. So there we are. I also want to acknowledge that last Friday, June 12th, was the fourth anniversary of the massacre at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. 49 people were killed. June 12th also happened to be the day that the current federal administration announced their rollback on healthcare protections, particularly for the transgender community. And I'm sure their excuse is the same as when they were confronted about doing a rally in Tulsa on Juneteenth. Oh, we didn't know. I'm sorry, isn't it about time if you're the administration for all citizens that you just don't know some of our history? There's also the Vermont Pride Festival on an up note that will actually be happening at the Chandler Theater in Randolph. It is going to be a virtual Zoom festival, July 17th to August 1st. Be looking in an upcoming episode for Ann Charles interviewing the people from the Pride Festival about what they're doing this year. Also on June 27th, 6 p.m. on Zoom, Linda Quinlan may have organized an LGBTQ positive poetry reading. And if you go onto the Kellogg Hubbard Library site, Rainbow Umbrella, The Alliance, or Momentum Facebook pages, you can find the list and be truly entertained by LGBTQ poets. And this time I'm thankful it was something that Linda organized on her own. <laughs> also, I just want to put out a uh, shout out that Momentum is continuing to do their virtual coffee hours every two weeks on Sundays, starting at 11 a.m. The next one is on June 28th. You can also look on the Rainbow Umbrella Facebook page. The census, if you haven't, please do. If you haven't, I could show up at your door. You're warned. And have you noticed a new look in Montpelier? State Street might have a slightly different feel to it. And Zach should be showing a picture at this point in time. But uh, however, I do want to point out that the day after Black Lives Matter was painted onto State Street, there was vandalism. We may feel confident being here in Vermont, but we definitely have work to do. So with that, it's, it's on to Anne. All right. I have many things to talk about today. Um, Poland is in the news because of all the uh, awful things being said by the um, president. Um, it got its first ever gay couple on television, but uh, they were in a commercial, a condom commercial as it happens, um, and for Durex condoms. But the advertisement was set to air uh, on major channels in Poland, as well as the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Lithuania, and it was pulled. And I have a clip before you now of the two, two of the actors in this commercial, Jakov Kwasinski and David Majcik, uh, and in their, the conversation that you'll see, they crystallize 
what's going on in Poland right now. So let's take a look at that. For Jacob Kuzinski, a ban by Poland's public broadcaster on a Jurex condom advert featuring him and his husband was unfortunately no surprise. But it raises fears for what the government will do next when it comes to LGBT rights in the staunchly Catholic country. We fear what's going to happen next. First they remove you from the advert, next they remove all LGBT themes from the movies and series, and then they'll say the Eurovision Song Contest can't be broadcast because there's too much LGBT in it. This is crazy. Broadcaster TVP told Reuters its decision not to air the commercial followed a quote, large number of complaints about advertising clips with intimate content. The ban on the ad, a rare instance of LGBT representation in Polish media, roughly coincided with a promise by President Andrzej Duda to allow no teaching of LGBT issues in schools if he wins a second term in office on June 28. Duda is an ally of the governing right-wing nationalist PIS party, which has labelled lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender ideology as invasive foreign influence that undermines traditional values. Kwasinski's husband, David Majcek, said Duda's re-election poses a serious threat to Poland's LGBT community. The election of President Andrzej Duda for another term, I think it will be the worst thing that could happen to the LGBT community. When he decides to sign the family card, which will discriminate against us in a very obvious way. Brussels-based NGO ILGA Europe this year voted Poland as the worst in the European Union for LGBT rights. They were, have been activists throughout. They have, you know, they uh, passed out masks during the pandemic, rainbow masks, and uh, they're very positive figures in Poland, although they're pretty discouraged as that clip demonstrates. Um, there's a blackmail list in Ghana, um, according to which LGBT activists fight con men posing on Grindr as lovers. There, uh, as we know, Ghana uh, penalizes same-sex relationships, but this uh, Ghana gay blackmail list is beginning to work. It exposes notorious persons who steal and blackmail, steal from and blackmail gay men. There are 1,800 followers. Um, there is a comparable list uh, in Nigeria, but it doesn't work as well. And as you know, in Egypt, Morocco, and Nigeria, as well as Ghana, gay men are often blackmailed and outed by fake dates who trick them into sharing information on uh, Grindr and elsewhere. Um, a decathlon, decathlon Turkey faces social media black backlash over gay posts. They, uh, decathlon um, Turkey is a branch of the sporting good scarf making, mask making um, organization. Uh, and it's originated in France and they put out a post supporting LGBT pride and were immediately greeted by an outcry um, and backlash in Turkey, uh, calls for boycott of the uh, business. Uh, one person said, um, how come you won't make the jobs and you'll endorse gay pride and you know there's been a, a big uh, problem there but they're sticking with their guns so to speak japan court rejects notion of same-sex couples and de facto marriages and i have a picture now before you of yashinde uchiyama 45 he's second from the right this poor guy his lover was murdered uh, by a colleague at work and he, because they were in a gay relationship for 20 years, uh, he can't get any bereavement benefits. He can't get any settlement, you know, um, 
afforded victims of the fa families of the victims of crime. So his suit was rejected, but they're going to they're going to appeal. There's a very sad story in another picture I have. Um, it's about an LGBT activist named um, Sarah Hagazi. There's her picture waving the rainbow flag. She was 30. She, in that um, concert I talked about three years ago by the Lebanese band, one of whom had a gay member, they waved the rainbow flag in the audience of the concert. Uh, they were a backlash followed immediately. She was arrested. She was in prison for three months, administered electroshock, electrocuted, tortured, emerged with terrible PTSD, threatened, lost her job um, for this one gesture, although she was an activist and she was a communist. And, um, so she was exiled to Canada. Her mother died. And finally, uh, after having to have another electroshock therapy session, she committed suicide at age 30. Egypt failed her, is what the headline reads rightfully. Get to know the cast of Where Your Eyes Linger, Korea's first LGBT drama, which portrays the love between two gay men. And I've got a picture now before you of the two actors, Han Ji Chan and Zhang Wei Su. And they play a couple in Korea, the, um, a, a rich, um, a romance between two young men, one the heir to a powerful family, the other his bodyguard. So there they are, and that's playing in Korea. Um, YouTube takes down an anti-gay ad after outrage in Russia. Putin is trying to ramp up the vote for his, you know, rubber stamp victory, if you ask me, at the, at the, by scapegoating gay people. And in this YouTube ad, uh, it's really offensive. Two, you know, a child is introduced to two gay men as his parents, and one man says, this is your mom, and, you know, they pull out a dress for the kid, and then the orphanage leader spits on the floor. It's awful. But YouTube has finally pulled it, although a number, of, you know, thousands of people have already seen it. Um, in a gesture from our U.S. statement, Department, the U.S. Embassy in Seoul removes the Black Lives Matter banner and the pride flag, courtesy of Secretary of State Pompeo. Oh. Mm hmm Gotta love them. Yeah. Pride events kick off in Shanghai with a city run. More than 100,000 people took part in this run for pride. And there's no lockdown in Shanghai. Apparently they have a low COVID-19 rate. So that's the first in the lineup of a lot of events for Pride that are occurring in Shanghai. Um, next, I have a picture now of a Maori transgender woman named Georgina Bayer. She's 62. She's sitting there on the parliament grounds after being a maid, a member, being made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit in the 2020 Queen's Birthday Honors. She's the, she became the first gender, transgender mayor in the world in 1995. Then she became the first transgender MP in 1999. And so she's being honored today, good for her. And finally, my last story concerns the 2020 Lambda Literary Award winners. And I'll have more of that anon. But now let's go to Linda. Well, thank you, Anne. Um, there are two big stories this week, um, <clears throat> which I'll go into a little more. But one is the, is the Supreme Court decision on workplace discrimination. And the second is, as Keith was talking about, um, Trump's revoking Obama's transgender health care protections. Um, and then we have um, hate groups designate June as, this is sort of funny and not funny, but uh, 
L E L M N O S plus month. Hate group leader and founder and former Virginia politician Eugene Delgado stars in a Vimeo announcing L M N O P month, which stands for lifestyle of mainstream normal ordinary people. Oh, this public group. This public group is called Public Advocates USA and is listed as an LGBTQ hate group. So, um, and sadly, this again, um, I, I, I don't know what to say about this um, transgender murders that are occurring in this country, but two women of color, transgender women were killed just as the national protest that Black Lives Matter, Dominique Reme, Remy Fells of Pennsylvania and Reha Milton of Ohio are the 11th and 12th victim, victims of trans people murdered this year. So, and the GOP has an interesting platform. They don't have, well, I haven't read that they've had anything good that they're proposing. But this is the platform of some of the platform of what they are going to have this year. And it is a ban on same sex marriage and transgender people in the military. The platform also supports gay conversion therapy and they want to make it legal for businesses to discriminate against LGBTQ people. So, um, I don't know what they're for, but that's certainly what they're against. A uh, trans woman wins a seat in Wheeling, West Virginia Council. She is the first trans woman elected to public office in the state. Rosemary Ketchum won by a slim margin in a four-way race, and here is her picture. Liberty University black staff members are quitting over Jerry Falwell's racist tweets. Mm -hmm. Trump's new appointee thinks the homo empire is taking over the world. Merrick Cordigan, appointed to USAID, has declared that the homo empire is driving the US and other countries towards a tyrannical agenda. She also believes that women's place is in the home except for her, I guess. It's kind of like a Phyllis Shafley of 2020. Um, Google gives $1.2 million grants to the Trevor Project and other LGBTQ organizations. And Brooklyn has a huge rally for trans Black Lives Matter. So um, that's what I have right now. So we will move to Keith. And thank you, Linda. So I want to talk a little bit about our legislature and a bit about how Vermont's responding to the Black Lives Matter Matters movement at current. Um, today, actually, the House finally voted on H611, the Older Vermonters Act. They did both the amendment, the second reading, and the third reading, which is the substantive vote within the chamber. All, it seemed as though just a matter of course, final vote was 133 to three. It was not a roll call vote, but because they're all on Zoom and have to raise their hand to be, to cast their vote, the clerk gets a numerical tally versus just the yays seem to have it or the nays. So now it is messaged over to the Senate, which has promised to work on it. Why we should be attentive is that as this bill was going through the House, members of the LGBTQ plus community testified about being more specific in its language to ensure that underrepresented communities, and specifically the LGBTQ plus community, was included in that service providing. And as I have said before, there is a difference between an organization that provides services to seniors saying, oh yes, all LGBTQ plus people are welcomed, 
versus creating programs specifically for and based upon the needs of LGBTQ plus seniors. What we're also going to be looking at is they're looking at bringing back together the task force that ended up creating the Older Vermonters Bill. Some of us will be pushing to ensure that it's not merely service providers who are part of the task force, but it's actually the voice of consumers and it's the voice of underrepresented communities. So one of the other things that seems to be happening in the legislature is they're really looking at policing in the state of Vermont. And the Senate Judiciary Committee in particular is looking at what could be put into statute relative to oversight, a statewide use of force standards. And one of the, the interesting pieces that's been happening relative to budgets, and it just happened in Burlington with the, the mayor releasing his budget. And actually the Scott administration that has been supporting this kind of move is taking some of the money out of the policing budget and reassigning it to support services so that law enforcement is not expected to deal with mental health crisis, homelessness, et cetera, that there will be money for actually mental health clinicians to be part of that expansive process so that policing will focus on policing and all of those service providing aspects will really be done by people who have been trained to do that. Fair and impartial policing is also looking at what they can do to create robust training that is in inclusive training so that we're not gonna see the kind of profiling statistics that have been released recently. And there is also the racial equity task force that has been formed and Unfortunately, I'm told they had a very short window looking for applications and that is already closed. So we're going to be looking really closely at who applied, who is on that, and what kind of direction they take. You know, what type of statewide vision they're going to put in place. And Commissioner Serling of public safety has said that there is a commitment to put body cams on all Vermont state police officers so there will be accountability. So that is sort of my quick overview. There will definitely be follow up. Stay tuned. And as Anne is unmuting herself, I'm turning it over to her. I am ready. I'm here to talk about the Lambda Literary Awards. This is the 32nd season, um, 32nd series of awards. They're um, given to literary works in the LGBTQ community that are particularly noteworthy uh, and that have been published during the year. There are 23 categories. So of course I can't get to all of them, but let's start. Um, lesbian fiction, you know, and I'd like to show you the book covers, but there were just too many. Uh, the Lesbian Fiction Award has been uh, given to Nicole Dennis Ben for a novel, Patsy. And we read her other book, Here Comes the Sun, which is fabulous. She's a Jamaican American writer. This um, Novel is a beautifully layered portrait of motherhood, immigration, and the sacrifices we make in the name of love. So check that out. Um, gay fiction has been awarded to Brian Washington's Lot, a collection of short stories in the city of Houston, a sprawling, diverse microcosm of America the son of a black mother and a Latino father is coming of age. So you might want to check that out. Bisexual fiction has been awarded to Exquisite Mariposa by Fiona Allison Duncan. 
uh, given the initials F.A.D. at birth, Fiona Allison Duncan has always had an eye for observing the trends around her. So, um, transgender fiction, the award goes to Little Blue Encyclopedia for Vivian, which is, uh, it sifts through a queer trans woman's unrequited love for her straight trans friend who died. Sounds a little intense. Let's move on to another category, if I may. Um, transgender nonfiction. I'm having a little trouble with my device. Okay. Transgender nonfiction is, well, let me go to uh, bisexual nonfiction. We'll come back to the transgender nonfiction. Uh, this has been awarded to a publication put out by Coffee House Fresh called Press called Socialist Realism by Trisha Lowe. Um, when Trisha Lowe moves west, her journey is motivated by the need to arrive somewhere better. Someplace utopian, like revolution, or safe, like home, or even clarifying, like identity. I've had that impulse. Um, transgender nonfiction. We both laughed in pleasure. The selected diaries of Lou Sullivan. Um, it narrates the inner life of a gay trans man moving through the shifting social, political, and medical mores of the second half of the 20th century. Is there time for me to do a couple more categories? Well, let me just do LGBTQ nonfiction. In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, we read her um, groundbreaking collection. Some of us read Her Body and Other Parties. This is her memoir about um, the dissection and mechanism and cultural representations of psychological abuse. It's about an abusive relationship. Um, lesbian poetry and More Black by Ty Freedom Ford. Uh, it's a direct Ingenious, vibrant, alive, queer, and black by terms tough and sexy, wrapped up in evolving language and scenes of life. I think I missed a couple of other winners, but let me keep going, if I may. Gay Poetry Slingshot by Cyri Jarrell Johnson. Begins with the author ensconced in the menacing isolation of the pastoral, but once the work migrates to the city, Monstrum glows from fangs. Interesting, very uh, intriguing, that description. Um, Pet Sounds, another interesting collection. Um, that's Bisexual Poetry by Stephanie Young. It's, a one, it's at once a book of confessional economics, music criticism, disguised as poetry. Transgender Poetry, Hull by Zandria Phillips, debut collection by African-American poet Zandria Phillips. All right. Now, there are other genres I'm not going to mention. Mystery, romance, children's fiction, young people's fiction. They, I, I personally am interested in LGBTQ studies, but the audience may not be, so I won't read them. And of course, the only other two I would like to mention are um, memoir, because the lesbian memoir is called We Have Always Been Here, a queer Muslim memoir by Samira Habib. She spent most of her life searching for safety and a place to be herself. She grew up in Pakistan. Um, and another memoir 
of great note is Gay Memoir, How We Fight for Our Lives by Saeed Jones. And he's a wonderful up and coming writer. I've seen him on book TV. TV. This is a stunning coming of age memoir. He tells the story of a young black gay man from the South as he tries, fights to figure out uh, how to exist in his world. So that's a brief precis of all the exciting literature that's coming out this year. So stay tuned. So Ann, can we look that up on a certain site? Like if people Certainly. want to see. You could Google Lambda Literary Awards. And what's wonderful is they have little clips because it's all on Zoom now. They have clips of the authors accepting their awards and they're like a minute clips. But you get a sense, I mean, they're all very excited. And uh, so Lambda, you could look up Lambda, Lambda Literary Awards org. The Lambda Literary Foundation began in 1976. It, it was the first source to really recognize LGBTQ literature, and they published the Lambda Book Report. Now the Lambda, um, the Lambda Literary Review. They had a wonderful bookstore in Dupont Circle in D.C. called Lambda Rising. But um, so I could talk indefinitely, but I think maybe I should pass the <laughs> microphone on to another member of our team. Well, I think that would be me. All right, let's hear from Linda. Well, to finish up a few stories here, you know, as um, Keith was saying, the Trump administration has revoked Obama's transgender health protections. Trump finalized this regulation and removed health care discrimination for transgender patients on the fourth anniversary of Pulse shooting in Orlando, Florida. With this, the Department of Health and Human Resources will only define discrimination protections according to sex as male or female, as determined by biology. Under Obama's Affordable Care Act, patients were protected from discrimination on, by, on the bias of gender identity. So um, we can't get rid of this man soon enough, if you ask me. Um, the Supreme Court determined Monday that the historic Civil Rights Act of 1964 protects LGBTQ employees from workplace discrimination and is a uh and it's you know it's a victory that i mean we don't have much to celebrate these days but this was certainly uh something to celebrate uh the law bans job discrimination based on sex because of sexual orientation or gender identity this decision is remarkable considering it is a conservative majority in uh the supreme court right now um, and the decision is also remarkable because, you know, a couple of conservatives were following the laws and the words of a liberal law. So I think we have a lot to celebrate here in terms of that victory. Um, a Chicago cop called a protester a faggot and lesbian mayor, Ms. Lightfoot, said she's not having it and uh, she will not stand for homophobia in her ranks. She is determined to identify the cop who was filmed hurling sexist and anti-gay slurs at a protester. When she finds him, she assures us he will be fired. And this is a really um, awful um, uh, story about um, Jerry Falwell and Liberty University and his black staff are quitting uh, because Falwell made a, uh, a racist tweet featuring an image of a black face and someone in a KKK hood. Falwell said of Virginia governor's, Governor Northam that he would only wear a mask if he could have the governor's black face on the cover of his yearbook. The, college's yearbook. Um, and I think that is pretty much it for me and stories here. 
So I think um, we have uh, an interview. Is that what comes next? Okay. Anne is going to interview Donna Ann McAdams, a uh, photographer of some note. And so um, let's hear it from Anne. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Donna Ann McAdams, a queer photographer who lives in um, Sandgate, Vermont, on a goat farm. But that's only her current uh, residence. She's lived in many places around the world and practiced photography for many years. So welcome, Donna. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you, Anne. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit, just give you the viewers a little rundown. You studied photography at the San Francisco Art Institute. You have an MFA, correct. You have an MFA in visual arts from Rutgers and a BA in cultural anthropology from Empire State College. As I said, you and your husband live on a goat farm. Um, you've taken a rural move in your career. <clears throat> You're exhibiting widely in Vermont, although with the pandemic, um, things have been put on hold. <clears throat> but you have upcoming shows um, when the quarantine is lifted. And I invite readers to go on your website to check in with uh, Performative X is the exhibit that's, that's being widely circulated. But first, I'd like to talk, if I may, with Donna about the um, pivotal purchase of camera film that occurred in San Francisco in 1975. <laughs> okay, so um, I moved to San Francisco in 73, and I was working as a dental assistant. <coughs> was living in uh, the Fillmore District in a, in a house with a bunch of people. And um, I was sitting in on classes at the San Francisco Art Institute. I wasn't taking them because I was working full time, but I was sitting in. Eventually I did enroll. And I was photographing as I did out in the neighborhood. And I was in Dolores Park and I ran, I ran out of film. And somebody said, oh, if you go down to Castro Street, which was close, I could, I could just get her all at the little store there. So I said, oh, okay. So I went and so I walked, walked down to the store and I went in and there was a big barber chair and there was a guy with long hair and a mustache and he had a really thick accent, Long Island accent, very much like my own. And he asked, he said, what do you need? And I said, I need some Tri-X. I need a roll of film. And he said, just one. And I said, I don't really have enough money for more than that. And he said, well, let me set up a charge account for you and you can come in here anytime and buy film. And I said, oh, that's great. And we got to talking and he was very encouraging about my work and what I was doing. And I didn't know who he was at then, but then I came to find out that he was the mayor of Castro Street and he was Harvey Milk. And from that, <laughs> from that point on, I became very involved in getting him elected. So, and I would, you know, go to the store and see him. And, you know, he was very, very kind and very supportive of my work as a young photographer. And actually, he's probably one of the reasons, one of the main reasons I'm an activist. Well, one of, go ahead. Because, of your, did, go ahead, you go first. It's exciting, right? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> one of the um, reviewers of your work said that our, Harvey Milk, you were learning technique at the San Francisco Art Institute, but he showed you how to shape it and to shape your work into activism. Yes, that was Matthew, that was Matthew Reimer who, and Leighton. Matthew and Leighton have a Instagram account, account called LGBT underscore history. And they're really fine gentlemen. And they, and Matthew wrote the introduction to one of the essays in my book. And he said, Matthew you don't Reimer. take Brown, Matthew Reamer and Leighton Brown. I always call Matthew by Leighton's last name, which is probably a mistake. And he use. said, looking at your photography is not looking at activism. Your photography is activism. 
Well, in any of the work that I do, I, I use the cam the camera is part of me, but labor and work is also part of what I need to do in order to make the photographs. So if you're going to a protest, like I went to, I was in Glens Falls uh, last Friday for the uh, Black Lives protest and I was part of the, the march. I marched with the young people very young women who had set that up. I marched with them. I didn't stand in front of them, although I did at, to get pictures that I needed, but I, I was with them, walking with them and yelling and not yelling, but, you know, chanting, shall we say. Sure. Well, apropos of that, let's look at one of the photos we've selected for today. Um, the number 38 in the catalog that covers an ACT UP march in New York. It's called Act Up, Act Up at the Waldorf Astoria, NYC 1990. You were there. Tell us how you happened to, it's a really wonderful photo. I hope the viewers are admiring it now. So, um, I, I attended a lot of Act Up uh, demonstrations from the very beginning. And uh, in that particular photograph, it was an action at the Waldorf Astoria. It was the first Bush. I guess he's 40, 41 and the other guy is 43. So it was the mm -hmm. first uh, And he was at the Waldorf Astoria and ACT UP had gotten into the Waldorf Astoria and dropped a banner down. And it was the first time that I had seen, they had used coffins before, but it was the first time that I was actually able to photograph them carrying coffins with writing on the side of the coffins. And so I climbed up, I jumped, climbed up this lamppost, skinnied up this lamppost. And uh, there was a guy holding the coffin. He's in the center of the photograph. And he looked and he said, be careful up there. And I said, uh, I'll be okay. And so I took the photograph and Matthew and Leighton loved that photograph. And I love that photograph too. We later came to find out that the man who actually spoke to me at the time of the photograph was the poet and activist a Soto Saint, who we who we lost to AIDS in 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't know that at the time, and Leighton and Ma Ma and Matthew didn't know when they did their book. And later later on, the power of Instagram, somebody saw the photograph on my feed or perhaps their feed, and said, "Do you know who that is?" And I said, "No." And so we we were able to I identify him and to give him homage and respect that he deserves as a as an activist and a a somebody we lost to aids well and, and it's sort of timely with the sign republicans kill me i mean it could be uh i mean you think we could just move on from that but mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well let's move on to other uh photographs of activism now let's go back to 1980 to Turkey Point, Miami. You said in your catalog that after Three Mile, Three Mile Island, you took a road trip and participated in several anti-nuclear demonstrations. So this so, is no, go ahead. What I, what, <laughs> so probably the women, women's rights, right to choose as a young person was one of the first things that I fought for in the 70s, early 70s. And then the next form of activism was getting Harvey elected. But when I moved back from San Francisco, having left San Francisco when Harvey was assassinated, I couldn't live there anymore. Uh, I didn't know what I was gonna do. And so I decided I was gonna to, to take pictures of industrial landscape. Now, I don't know why. And so I took a trip to Peekskill, New York, to the Indian Point, nuclear power plant in October of 1978 and, and photographed that power plant. And then Harrisburg happened on March 28th, 1979. And so I became very committed to anti, the anti-nuclear movement. And um, that photograph, I was traveling with two other women and I learned to juggle because I wanted to take a photograph in front of a nuclear power plant and I wanted to talk about human error like how simple it would be to, to have a mistake or to screw up or not be able to know what to do so we we I staged that and you put it on a poster entitled yeah. they're juggling our genes 
and I wheat pasted back in the day thousands of those posters. They were made, they were eight and a half by 11. I worked in a Xerox store, a copy shop. So I had them and I went around all over New York, but I took a cross country trip with these posters. And then I took it to California and then I came back again, gluing them all over wherever I could, you know, lamp posts or the sides of buildings. I, so it was, it was a, a street piece as well as a, a photograph. So, yeah. Let's move on to our third uh, photograph, which has an interesting history also. And we're moving now to the um, area of queer performance. Um, this is called uh, Lori East Side Assists Ethel Eichenberger, PS122, NYC, 1987. And, you know, uh, Lori, Lori Side has a epigraph here. The beloved performer Ethel Eichelberger, Eichen, Eichelberger was about to perform a song from Minnie the Maid when her accordion strap broke. The packed audience gasped, but Ethel just kept her rapid fire ad libs going. As I quickly pushed a piano onto the stage behind her, she now said, Now I had a piano to the near and cheer near to the roaring cheers of the audience. Reorienting herself on her knees to play, she quipped, Now if only I had a piano bench. Just as I circled around the piano with one, Donna caught the, that exact moment, one of my favorites from a lifetime of phenomenal moments caught by Donna Ann McAdams. Within that one photograph, Donna captured the love, trust, joy, and community of live performance. Tell wow. us about so PS122 was always referred to in the early days when we first got press as the petri dish of performance art work. And PS122 was the place where under the guidance of Mark Russell, who was the, exec was the artistic director and executive director, a lot of innovative and political work was performed. A lot of queer work, a lot of marginal work, a all during the AIDS crisis, people had a home there. PS122 was sort of like our church. It was where we went to celebrate queer life and the loss of life because we were losing so many people in the, in the arts community, especially the dance and performance community to AIDS. And so it was our home. And Lori was an, well, Lori was an incredible and still is an amazing, uh, she's a great photographer and an activist of herself. Usually if I'm at a protest, she's somewhere around with me. Um, she's, she's, she was my first girlfriend and I adore her. So in addition to PS122, I just have to throw, I have to also say that the WOW Cafe on 4th Street, which is struggling now, they need, they have no money, they need money, plug for WOW to pay the rent on their space because they're not, nobody's going to the theater. So I would spend a lot of time there in the company of women who played all the roles. So it was, I was really lucky to have PS122 and the WOW Cafe uh, as my places to go and the privilege to be able to photograph a lot of incredible, amazing performers from, you know, Oh, gee, We're going back many, many years, till 2006 when I moved to Vermont. Yeah. And we'll, we'll have to come, invite you back to talk about this current chapter of your history. We've almost run out of time, believe it or not. Are there any parting words you want to share with the audience? Well, I'd like to say that I'm really happy to be here in Vermont. I'm really proud of Bernie Sanders and the work he's doing. I'm happy to be a goat farmer. I love my girls. You know, I live with an amazing man, Brad Kessler. Novelist. Novelist, good guy. So I'm really, I'm really happy to be here in Vermont. So I'm, I'm lucky. I live in a great, great community. Uh, you know, we're worried about our hay. We're not getting enough rain. But aside from that, you know, you know, things are okay. Wonderful. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you for coming. And we'll have to ask you to come again. I'd love to. Well, that was an interesting interview, Anne. Yes, it was fun. And 
you know, she's showing all around the state once the pandemic lifts, we can see her work in Stowe and Castleton and elsewhere. Okay, good. And um, I think we have trivia, don't we? Or we've done our trivia. Keith, you're muted. But I like being muted. <laughs> I hate it. It's one of my better features. <laughs> so Stonewall, June yeah. 28, 1969. How many people were actually arrested? And the answer is 13. So with that, Linda. Okay. Let's all hang in here, be safe, be well, and we'll see you in two weeks. And in the meantime, resist. <laughs>